Lord. Thank you for that, Miss Molly. Take your Bibles, if you would, uh, this morning, church, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 3. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 3, and, and as you're turning your Bibles there, um, <clears throat> an announcement I, I failed to make uh, just moments ago. Uh, somebody had informed me that there was a, um, I, I can't give you a lot of the details, but uh, just because I don't know a lot of the details, but there, I guess evidently that there was somebody who, who was preaching uh, there on the streets, and then, of course, we just live in a, in a wicked world. Uh, somebody had shot this street preacher in the head, and, and so it's just a, it's, it's tragic. It's a tragic story, uh, it's, and, and so uh, I believe he's, I believe he's still alive. Is that right, Brother? He's still alive, and, and so just um, if, if anybody would like to, uh, we'll, we'll put him on the prayer sheet. Get, I'll get the name of him. I, the name escapes me. We'll put him on the prayer sheet as well. And then also uh, the, what the family has done is that they've, they, they sent out a link for uh, a possibility to help with the funds of the medical expenses. If you want to help with that, pray about that, come see me after the service, and we'll, we'll get that to you. So I want to make that announcement. We can certainly pray. We can certainly pray. And, and so let's, let's, let's commit to do that for sure. So Luke chapter number three is where we're at. So let's all stand, church, out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter number three, verses 15 through 19. Luke chapter number 3, verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> the Bible says this. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in the hand, and he shall, uh, who, verse seventeen. Whose hand is in his hand, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the patriarch, being reproved by him for Herodias his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all that he shut up John in prison. And the title of this message this morning is The Description of John the Baptist's Ministry. The Description of John the Baptist's Ministry. Now, church, uh, if Jesus, the Lord Jesus, were to say this about John the Baptist, there's none greater born of women than John the Baptist, then I think we need to take note of his ministry. I think we, I think, and I think it can help us. And I believe it will help us. So let's have a word of prayer, and then uh, you can be seated. Father, we come before you, Lord, this morning. And, Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that you'd be with our church services, Lord, this morning. And, and Father, I need your help. And, Lord, I always do. And I ask you that your word would just make itself so clear. And, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would move amongst us this morning. Touch our hearts, Lord, and may our, our minds and our hearts and our ears be open today. And, Father, I do pray, Lord, for this gentleman who, who, is, who has been shot, Lord, for just trying to do what you've called him to do. And I just ask you, Lord, to please be with him, be with the family, be with the medical expenses there. And I just pray, Lord, that your will and way would be done. And, Father, I pray that you just um, help us now, Lord, to open up the word and, Father, hear what you have to say. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I praise the Lord for the testimony of Calvary Baptist Church here in Sterling. I, I really do. I'm very, very thankful for the testimony of this church. This past year, we celebrated 70 years as being a local New Testament church in Sterling, Colorado. And uh, I, I'm very, very thankful that the, this church has never come to a place where there was a, a time or even a temptation to close the doors of this place. At least that I'm aware of. I don't think that there's ever been the temptation to, to close the doors, to pack up shop, and, and to and to move, and to, to go somewhere else. I'm very thankful for the 70 years of God being faithful here. I'm very, very thankful for that. And, and I'm also thankful that the testimonies that I've heard, uh, that I personally have heard from, from people about our church. Now, I can't speak on behalf of the previous pastors. I can't speak on behalf of Brother Young or, or even pr those prior to him. Uh, but, but I have heard other, pre or other people and preachers say this about our church, that our church is a friendly church. I'm, I'm very, very thankful to hear, to hear that, that that's the perception of the community of our church. I've heard people say this. This is a good one. I've heard people say that this is a biblical church. 
Amen. I'm an amen and amen for that. I'm very thankful uh, that our church is perceived by the community as being a biblical church. I had one gentleman say this to me. He says, uh, Patrick, I feel like I went back in time and attended a church service the way it should be. <laughs> and that wasn't just because they had wood paneling back then. No, no that wasn't it. No, no, no. And listen, he, 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 of course, he just wasn't talking about the hymns or even about the preaching, but he was also talking about the sweet fellowship that he was welcomed with uh, from our church. And, and, and Calvary Baptist Church, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And, and, and you know, here's the thing. I'm not trying, I don't want Calvary Baptist Church to be a people-pleasing church. I, I, I don't want that at all. I mean, if, if we become a church that's all about being a people-pleasing church, then we're going in the wrong direction. We will certainly go in the wrong direction, but I, I truly believe this, that if we're honoring God as best as we can through the word and by, by loving him and trying to be a blessing to others, then listen, we're going to have a good testimony. We will have a good testimony. You know, uh, that's the type of perception we want the community to have about Calvary Baptist Church. And, and, and listen, we want the perception of Calvary Baptist Church to be good, but we also want it to be accurate. We want it to be accurate. Now, in light of uh, our text this morning, the ministry of John the Baptist was growing. His, his, his popularity was growing. His, uh, uh, I, I hate to use this word, but I can't think of a better one. His fame was starting to grow. And, and people, they were beginning to have a perception of who the John the Baptist was. Now, it was a misperception, unfortunately. But the crowds had a perception about John. And they, when they looked at John, they made an assumption about him that wasn't true. Verse number 15 says, and as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. Now listen, this is a phenomenal testimony about John. This is a phenomenal testimony because as John's popularity was beginning to grow there, people were looking at John and they're listening to him preach or listening to him teach. Now we talked about it last week. There was nothing eye appealing about John. Remember. He was a man who lived out in the wilderness. He was a man who ate locusts. He was a man who was covered in camel's hair. There was nothing appealing about him. Even where he lived, there was nothing appealing about that. He was a man in the wilderness, but what was so appealing, what was so catching, was the message that he preached. That was what was very, very catching, and that's what caught the attention of the people. And so now these people, they're hearing John preach, and now they're contemplating this in their minds. Is this the Christ. That, there could be no greater compliment given to John than that right there. Is this the Christ? Now, now listen, church family, as believers, our lives, we should be concerned about how our lives appear unto others. We, we, we should. Listen, I'm not talking again about being concerned about the approval of others, but I am talking about that our lives, the way that it should look, should be pleasing to our Savior. Church family, God does care about the outside. He does care about the outside. Now understand, he doesn't start by changing the outside. He starts by changing the inside. And once there's a change on the inside, whether it's through discipleship and, 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 and through Bible study and through Bible reading and being, being plugged in and, allowing the Holy, and following the Holy Spirit of God and, and submitting to him and yielding to him, then eventually the change that took place inwardly will start to make its way manifest outwardly. It will start to be evident through a changed life there. Now, as the people, they made these assumptions about John that he was the Christ based on his testimony. John, he was very, very quick to not claim that title. Look at verse 16. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. Now, listen to this. But one mightier than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. Now listen, church, if John so chose to, he could have misled the people to believing him to be someone that he wasn't. If he wanted to. I mean, they're already of the, of the assumption, is he the Christ? Is he the Savior? Is he the prophesied one? Is, is he the anointed one? I mean, listen to him preach. I mean, this man is preaching with fervor. This man is preaching with zeal. And he's preaching a, a message of repentance. And it's striking the hearts. And people are, are being baptized. They're, they are moving through the messages uh, that he is preaching. He must be the Christ. Listen, if John was a man of little character, and if John was a man who only cared about gathering numbers and gathering a crowd, he could have easily have claimed the title, I am the Christ. 
He could have done that. But praise God, John had more character than Lucifer. He had more character than Lucifer. And and he says this, no, 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 no. There's one who is mightier than me. There is one who's going to come after me. He is mightier than I am. And whose shoe latchets I'm not unworthy to unloose. There's nothing eye appealing about feet. Some of you ladies think you have cute feet. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Just going to stop. Not going any further than that. <laughs> Come on. I'm not trying to uh, insult your intelligence here, but we know in Bible days, they didn't have shoes that covered their feet. We, we know that basically all that they really had was just a leather strap, maybe a, a half an inch or a quarter of an inch uh, uh, thick, and they strapped that to their feet, and they tied it to them. And here's what John is saying. The one who comes after me, listen, he is so much mightier than I am. He is so much greater than I am. Uh, uh, listen, I'm not even worthy to touch the thing that touches his feet. I'm not even worthy of doing that. And listen, John had a right perception about the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a right view of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what, Calvary Baptist Church, I think it's very, very important that we have a right perspective of the Savior. I think it's very, very important that we understand, listen, He is high and He is holy and He is worthy. And and what we need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is that we ought not try to bring Jesus down to our level. Listen, He already did that by Himself. He already came down and became man. Uh, he, already put, he already set aside his glory and wrapped himself in human flesh. He's already done all those things. But, but listen, John had a right perspective about who Jesus is, about who the Savior is. And he's saying this, I'm not even worthy to touch the things that touch his feet. Not even worthy of doing that. So after John explains that the Christ will be greater and, and, and will come after him, John describes that when the Christ comes, He will come with a different type of baptism. Look at verse 16. About the middle part, second part of verse 16, he says, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 17, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will he burn with fire unquenchable. Now, these verses, we're going to take a little bit of time to explain and to grasp what John was talking about here. Now, listen, everyone knew what John's baptism was about. And if they didn't know what John's baptism was about, he would let them know what his baptism was about. Listen, when when John, when he came baptizing, he came primarily to preach a message of repentance. That was it. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, 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 repent. Listen, John's baptism was not some new religious fad. John's baptism wasn't something that they just did religiously. Oh, this this looks good. Let's just baptize just for happenstance sake. Let's just do it that way. No, no, no. Paul, uh, not Paul, but what John often did was that those who came without a reverence for repentance, without, uh, a, 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 with, without desiring to have a repentant heart, this is what John said to them. He said, whoa, 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 you're just a bunch of vipers. Bring forth fruit of repentance first. And then John says, then I'll baptize you. So everybody knew that baptism wasn't just a religious practice. No, it was something that symbolized something else. It was an outward expression of an inward change. That's what it was. That's what it is. It's an outward expression of an inward change. And so John, uh, he's explaining to them, though, that when the Savior comes, the Savior's baptism will be different. He talks about he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, here's the thing. The people would have known what John's baptism was all about. But when John says that he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, they have no idea what that means. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. What's the Holy Ghost? Well, I guess a better way to phrase that is who is the Holy Ghost? Well, who's the Holy Ghost and and what, what all does this mean? Okay, church, I'm not going to try to overcomplicate this, all right? But I'm just going to try to put it simply. So I'm a pretty simple fella. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a pretty simple fella. So I want to break things down pretty simple. When a person places their faith in the Savior, you get all of the Holy Spirit. When you place your faith in the Savior, it's like John saying, listen, when you place your faith, when you've repented and you place in your faith in the one who comes after me, listen, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. The word baptized means immersion. 
It means to be completely covered. Uh, listen, I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm not trying to do it. But this is not baptism. This is not baptism. This is not baptism. Uh, 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 baptism is complete immersion. Uh, I, I mean, the Word of God tells us when Jesus was baptized, he came up straightway out of the water. Listen, for any other reason why we should baptize by immersion is because Jesus did it. And, and really, that should be good enough. But, but literally, the actual word baptize, uh, uh, baptize, the actual Greek word means to, to immerse, to be completely covered. And so when a person, when they place their faith in the Savior to come, they're going to get all of the Spirit. They're going to get all of the Holy Ghost. But John, John also went on to say that the Savior who comes, he will also baptize with fire. What's that talking about? Well, this is referring, this has to do with judgment. Judgment. John, he goes on to explain what he means by using an analogy that they would have very clearly have understood. The analogy is in verse number 17. Let me read that again. It says, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will he burn with fire unquenchable. So what's this talking about here? See, they would have understood that. I think we need to explain this. See, the word fan here, it's referring to an instrument, and what they would often do is that they would take their grain, and this instrument would be somewhat kind of like a shovel or maybe like a pitchfork, and they would take their grain, and what they would do is that they would fling it up into the air. And when they would fling it up into the air, they would fling it up in the air so that the wind would blow, and as the wind blows, it would separate the chaff from the grain. That's what it would do. And by the time it hit the ground, you'd have the grain, you have the, uh, the, the wheat, or, and then you have the chaff of it. And so uh, when, when they would do that, there would be a separation that takes place. And what the people would do is that they would gather all the grain, and they would store it in their barns, or they would store it, and they would save it. But the chaff, what good is the chaff for? Well, the only thing that the good the chaff would be for is burning. That's all it would be. And so basically what John the Baptist is saying, he's telling the people when the Savior comes, people, they will either believe on him or they will not. They will either receive him or they will not receive him. But listen, if you receive him and you believe on him, it's like you're the grain and you'll be saved And when you have the, the Holy Spirit of God with you. But listen, but if you don't receive him, you're like the chaff and the only thing that awaits you is judgment by fire, church. Calvary Baptist Church, hell is a very real place. Yes. It is as real as this room that you are sitting in this morning. It is a very real place. And ladies and gentlemen, there are only two places where people go when they pass from this life into eternity. Again, not trying to pick a fight. Purgatory is nowhere in the Word of God. Right. It's not there. Read it yourself. Open up the Word of God. Study it yourself. Purgatory is not there. There is only one of two places where a sinner will go. If a sinner repents, that's the message that John was preaching. If a sinner repents and they put their faith in the Savior who came, then here's the thing, then they're saved and they have the Holy Ghost. They're baptized with the Holy Ghost. But wait a minute. But if they don't, then here's what awaits them. Unquenchable fire. That's it. The Bible goes on to say this. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. That means, yes, John preached about the Savior and that they should repent and put their faith in him. But also, John was a preacher who preached against sin. Now, Luke speaks about John's confrontation with Herod the, Herod the Tetrarch in verse number 19. Luke there says, But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all evils which Herod had done. Okay, who was Herod the Tetrarch? Well, what does that even mean, the Tetrarch? Well, Herod the Tetrarch, he, he would basically govern one-fourth of the area of Galilee. So he was a governor of sorts. And the Bible says that John reproved Herod for taking Herod's brother's wife. So he, basically this is what happened. John confronted a man of authority about his sin. He confronted him. Uh, listen, John wasn't concerned about the position or status that Herod had. 
No, the only thing that John was concerned about was that people would respond to the message that God had called him to preach. Well, again, what was the message that God had called John to preach? It was a message of repentance. Listen, in order for Herod to repent, he first had to be confronted about his sin. He had to do that. And that's what John did. And listen, John didn't pull punches when he preached. John didn't pull punches when he was confronting uh, Herod about his sin. In Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel, John, we see John telling Herod, listen, it's not lawful for thee to have your brother's wife. It's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife, is what he said. Listen, John, he, he wasn't a preacher who was concerned about what Herod would think of him. He was, he, was a, he was not a preacher who was timid. Listen, he was a preacher that only did this. Preach the word of God to everybody. Confront people about their sin. Why? To win an argument? No. Why? To show how much smarter you are about scripture? No. So that people will repent. That was it. That was the motive. But for John to be the bold preacher that he was, it cost him. It cost him. Look at verse 19 and 20 again. He says, But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, now look here, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. What does this mean? It means this, that John confronted Herod about his sin, and because he did that, because John stood for righteousness, because John preached against sin, it landed him in prison. And eventually, that's where he would lose his life, in prison. Well, that's a downer. <laughs> how, does, how does this affect you and I? How, how, what's this got to do with anything? Well, church, when Luke wrote this, once again, he, he mentioned that, he will mention John the Baptist again in chapter number 7. But he really gave somewhat of a description of John's ministry in these verses here, in these five verses. So how does Luke describe John the Baptist's ministry? Well, Luke describes John the Baptist's ministry as a ministry that points people to the Savior, all the while standing against sin. That was his ministry. Pointing people to the Savior to come, but also taking a stand for righteousness. Taking a stand against sin. Now listen, I don't think that this is something that we should ignore or just consider to be something that applies only to John. No, listen church, I think that as a church, the ministry that we should have should be a biblically based. Should be biblically based. And I think that there's a principle here that we as a church, that we can hold on to and say, listen, if we're going to have a biblically based ministry, then I think we can look at this and come to this conclusion that if our church is going to be a biblically based ministry, then our church must be a church that will always point people to the Savior. Always point people to the Savior, but also taking a good stand against sin. If we're going to be a biblically based church, if we're going to be a church that, that stands for righteousness, then what we must do is we must always be a church that is leading people to the Christ who came and also being willing to take a stand and say this. No, 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 no. This is what God's word has to say about the, the way of the culture. This is what God's word has to say about what is being deemed as okay today. This is what God's word has to say. So therefore, if we're going to be a biblical base, then we must take a stand, church. We have to. Listen, our first priority as a church should always be keeping the main thing the main thing. You awake this morning? Our, our main priority should always keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing or the sole purpose for our existence is not for our mere entertainment. Listen, the, our mere existence as a church, God has allowed by his grace, Calvary Baptist Church should be around here for 70 years. But the purpose for our existence for 70 years is not to just be a social gathering. That's not, the, that's not the purpose of Calvary Baptist Church. The purpose of Calvary Baptist Church is not to have social gatherings and fellowships. That's not the purpose of that. Listen, don't get me wrong. I love fellowships. Uh, I love the chili cook-off we just had. Yeah, I did. 
I really did. I, I, I enjoyed the fellowships. I, I enjoyed spending time with one another. I enjoy that. I enjoy the friendships. I enjoy the memories that are being made as a church family. I, I love that. I certainly do. But the sole purpose for our existence is not for any of those reasons. The sole purpose for the existence of Calvary Baptist Church is so that the main purpose would be this, that we as a church would be a way to navigate people to the Savior who came. That's it. Our purpose for the existence of the local New Testament church is so that lost people will come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The purpose of Calvary Baptist Church is that we would not be a respecter of persons for the gospel. The purpose of Calvary Baptist Church is, listen, is so that every house in Sterling, Colorado will know about Jesus. Every home, every family in our community that's the purpose for our existence. That every home would know about who Jesus is. Not just, not just our community, but around the world. That's our purpose. Around the world. Pastor Richard, how in the world can we make sure that people know about Jesus all the way around the world? That's why we support missionaries. That's why you should support missionaries. Listen, when you put money in that offering envelope and you mark it a designated for missions, listen, that is going to make sure that the gospel ministry is reached all the way around the world. That's what it's for there. Listen, church, if we're going to be a biblically based church, if we're going to have a ministry mindset that's biblically based, then we must understand this about our church. Our main purpose is is to keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is making sure that people know who Jesus is. My fear, though, is that there are a lot of churches that are not concerned about keeping the main thing the main thing. There's plenty of churches that are not keeping the main thing the main thing. You know, church, it's quite possible that while the gospel is a thing, we don't make it the main thing. Listen, if we're not careful, we can make fellowships the main thing, but just make the gospel a thing. See what I'm talking about? If we're not careful, then we can make relationships and we can make fellowships and we can make activities the main thing of our church or what our church is mainly known for while the gospel is just a thing that we're known for. No, no, no okay. Listen, I want the main thing of Calvary Baptist Church to be the thing that Christ told the first church and it was this Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, if we're going to make the main thing the main thing in here at Calvary Baptist Church, and, and that's a church that points people to the Savior, then that means this. It's going to take all of us getting on board. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us, not just staff. It's going to take all of us. Well, why is that? Because here's the thing. This church is made up of individuals. We understand what the church is. The church is not the building. The church is the people. And if the main thing is really going to be the main thing here at Calvary Baptist Church, and not just a thing that Calvary Baptist Church touches on every now and then, no, if it's going to be the main thing, then here's the thing. It's going to take each and every one of us having a heart for the gospel. It's going to take each and every one of us having a heart for the lost. It's going to take each and every one of us having a heart to maybe go out and pass out a gospel track a time or two. It's going to take each and every one of us to step out of our comfort zone and to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, let me ask you this. If you expect Calvary Baptist Church to keep the main thing the main thing, then you have to ask yourself as a member of Calvary Baptist Church, is the main thing the main thing in your life or just a thing in your life? Because very easy, it could just be a thing. Very easily, it could just be a thing that we, the pastor touches on every now and then. No, 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 no. Thank the Lord for 70 years. But just because it's been around for 70 years, doesn't mean we're guaranteed another 70 years. Doesn't mean we're guaranteed the next five years. Satan can get in here and he can kill this church tomorrow. He easily could. But here's the thing, church. If the main thing is going to be the main thing, then the main thing must resonate in your heart and in my heart, in all of our hearts, 
if it's going to be the main thing. Now listen, if, if the main thing is going to be the main thing, then, then we must also not just have a heart for the gospel and sharing the gospel, but we also need to have a stand against sin. Come on, church, we have to have a stand against sin. I, I mean, in our day and time which we live in, it's like everything under the sun is being condoned. Everything under the sun is being accepted nowadays. Everything under the sun is being promoted nowadays. But, but if we are really going to keep the main thing the main thing, then we must take a stand against sin. Listen, we cannot be a church that propagates the gospel all the while condoning the very sins that Christ wants to save people from. We, we, we just cannot do that. But if we're going to take a stand against sin, be willing to understand that there will be people who do not want to hear what you have to say. There will be people who do not like the idea of being told no about their sin. Now, okay, now listen. If we're going to confront people about their sin, we need to go about it the right motive. We need to go about it the right way. Okay, like, um, confronting people about their sin should never be done with the motive of winning an argument. You with me? It should never be done with the motive of winning a debate. It should never be done. I, I, I've, I have never personally seen somebody be converted when the motive was to bash somebody with the word of God. Never seen that done. This is what God's word says this. This is what God's word says about this. This is what God's word says about that. And they have nothing to say. Ha! I win the argument. You may have won an argument, but they just might turn people off to the gospel from that point forward. Our motive for confronting people about their sin should never ever be, I'm right, you're wrong, you get on board with what I say. That should never be the case. The motive for confronting people about their sin should be John's motive. What was John's motive? Repent. Repent. Repentance is the motive. Now, now church, it's possible. It's possible that maybe a reason why there are so many Christians who don't take a stand against sin is because there are many Christians who are participating in it. Is it very, it's quite possible that there are many Christians who don't have the main thing, the main thing of their life is because they're not taking a stand against sin in their own personal lives. And they're condoning it. Now, church, our motive should be this, that we confront people about their sin because they're going to end up in one of two places. They're either going to be saved as they're, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, or they're going to be chaff burning in eternal fire. And our motive should be that they would, that they would repent. But it's possible that our propagation of the gospel may very well also cost us something. It may cost you something. You know, there are missionaries around the world that are facing that very thing. Preaching the gospel could cost them something. Cost them their freedoms. Cost them their lives. But here's the thing. They understand how crucial it is. They understand it. Well, how crucial is it? It's so crucial that they will spend eternity in one of two places. That's how crucial it is. Is it crucial to you? Is propagating the gospel crucial to you? Letting people know about the Savior who came, is that crucial to you? Or is that just a thing in your life? Is that just a thing of your Christian life? Is that just a thing of your Christianity, but it's not the main thing? Listen, church, as a church, the main thing must be the main, the main thing. Yeah. Ask yourself this question. Ask yourself a series of these questions. Do I have a heart to talk to people about the gospel? Do I have a heart to talk to people about the gospel? Do I have a heart that looks at lost people and breaks? Do I have that? Now, here's the thing. We can talk ourselves out of giving the gospel. We can talk ourselves out of giving the gospel to just about anybody. 
We really can. Okay, for example, wake up now. For example, you see a beggar at Walmart? I'm going to say this. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. That's good advice right there. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God, he's the one who knocks on your heart to give a beggar at Walmart a gospel tract. He, the Holy Spirit of God knocks on your heart to tell that beggar at Walmart about the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you, the Holy Spirit of God knocks on your heart to let that beggar know that you might not be able to provide him physical food, but you can give him a bread that lasts everlasting. You might be able to give him that. But the Holy Spirit of God, as he's knocking on your heart and convicting your heart to do that, to step forward by faith, you can talk yourself out of following the Holy Spirit of God. You can talk yourself out of by saying something like this. Well, he's only concerned about his booze and drugs. And he's not going to want to listen to me. You can talk yourself out of that. You can see somebody who's financially well off. You can see somebody who uh, has a nice home, who has a nice car, and, and, and they might be a doctor or a lawyer or, or whatever the case might be, and God's blessed them financially. But the Holy Spirit of God, he's knocking on your heart to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might come up with the excuse in your mind and say this, well, they're already so well off, they're probably snobbish. They probably won't, have, won't want to hear anything that I have to say. Because they're financially wealthy. Listen, one's too poor that you shouldn't give the gospel. And one's too rich that you shouldn't give the gospel. Now here's what we just need to do. If we're going to keep the main thing the main thing, we need to follow the Holy Spirit of God and do as he says and let, be willing to let everybody know that Jesus came. He loves them. He died on the cross for their sins. And he's willing to save them. And when they place their faith in him, they get all of the Holy Spirit of God. And now they have an eternal home in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. But if they don't put their faith in the Lord Jesus, if they don't step out by faith and acknowledge their sin and call upon him for salvation, if they don't do that, then they are destined an eternal lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Listen, our responsibility is to not make sure that we go to people that we know who will receive the gospel. Our responsibility is to go to people and tell them about the gospel. I'm thankful for the testimonies of people of our community. That what they have to say about our church. It's a biblical church. Praise God. It's a friendly church. Praise God. But you know what, church? As great as those compliments are, and as wonderful as those compliments are, I want our church to be known for this. We keep the main thing the main thing. That's it. The main thing, the main thing. We point people to the Savior all the while we stand against sin. We don't condone it. We don't put a stamp of approval on it. We don't turn a blind eye to it. No, 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 listen, if you're going to take a stand against sin, understand it can cost you relationships. Understand that. If you're going to take a stand against sin, listen, church family, it could also cost us church members. It can do that. If you're going to take a stand against sin, listen, it can cost you a raise at the workplace. It can cost you popularity. It can cost you acceptance by your peers. Listen, it could even cost us our liberty in the future. Could also do that. Pastor Richard, I, I just don't know. Is it really worth all that? Is sharing the gospel and taking a stand against sin, is it really worth all that? Well, let me just tell you how much it was worth. It was worth the very Son of God. It was worth His precious blood. It was worth him. And listen, and if he deemed it worthy to be hated and crucified, then I think it's important, church, that we deem it worthy to make it the main thing at Calvary Baptist Church. But if we're going to make it the main thing at Calvary Baptist Church, then you're going to have to make it the main thing in your life. Is the gospel the main thing or is it just a thing? Is your stand against sin a thing? Well, it's okay. Well, it's all right. Well, it's not that big of a deal. No, no, it is a big deal. It is a big deal. Sometimes we can, we can allow sin in our lives so much for so long that it just doesn't even bother us anymore. How's your stand against sin? How's your stand for the gospel? If we're going to be a church that keeps the main thing the main thing, then it must then it will require all of us keeping the main thing the main thing. We point people to the Lord Jesus 
all the while we take a good stand, a good stand against the sin of this world. Where do you stand this morning? Well, I believe taking, telling people about Jesus is important. But I don't know if my stand against sin is as radical as yours, Pastor. Don't. I understand. The office of the pastor is supposed to be an example. But our ultimate example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's our ultimate example. Be ye holy, for I am holy. He's not saying be ye holy because your pastor's holy. Your pastor's still working on his holiness. Just saying. But be ye holy, for I am holy. Church, let's take a stand for the gospel and take a stand against sin and keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this day. And Lord, Father, I'm not too sure on how you may have spoken to the hearts of your people. Perhaps maybe, Lord, you've spoken to the hearts of your people in the sense that they know that the gospel is important, but they've allowed other things in their lives to be the main thing. Perhaps they made their jobs the main thing. Perhaps they made their retirement the main thing. Perhaps they made their hobbies or sports or school, basketball, football, or, or, or whatever the case might be, the main thing of their lives. And the gospel is just a thing. Dear God, I pray that you please help us. Please help us, Lord, to keep the main thing the main thing in each and every one of our hearts. That we would be Christians who will point people to your son, Jesus. Because ultimately, people will spend eternity in one of two places. Forever in your presence, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Or in eternal judgment. Where the flame, where the worm dieth not. Where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Lord, I pray that you do a working in our hearts for the lost. I pray, Lord, that we be sensitive to your Spirit's leading. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us take a stand for the gospel and take a stand against sin. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand.